Welcome to Autocomplete. It's Roadshow's weekly podcast about the intersection of all that's going on with cars and technology. I'm Brian Cooley, editor-at-large, joined from the East Coast by our editor-in-chief, Tim Stevens. And uh, Tim, we've been busy on a lot of things on Roadshow. Let's get some highlights out of the way before we dig into the news. Uh, Emmy's been out in a new Mini Cooper convertible. Right, so she took uh, the new convertible for a spin and uh, quite enjoyed it. Uh, you know, that seems like a car that's pretty well suited for Emmy, but uh, you know, drop top minis make a whole lot of sense, and uh, she had a lot of fun in this guy. And we get a lot, of, we get a lot of requests, a lot of email about minis. For whatever it is, the roadshow audience is is pretty mini centric. John Wong went out in the new C Class Coupe, hot looker right there, and of course, the Carfection folks are quite happy that we've got a new V12 Aston Vantage with a manual, one of the rare birds out there that combines big power and three pedals. Right, you don't see too many of those on the market anymore. And, and speaking with the Aston product planners, they said there were very low adoption of manual transmissions, but ultimately it's nice that they're throwing that in there, a bit of a nod to the fans, especially as we have the new uh, DB11 coming very soon. Yeah, there's something sort of uh, anachronistic about a manual in the super high-end cars, but I'm glad they're hanging in there. And I know uh, uh, a too. lot of folks uh, that are part of our part of our audience are going to say, absolutely, someone's got to hold the line. Uh, let's take a look at what's going on in the news here. A lot of it, of course, centered around Google's I.O. conference for developers that uh, uh, took place this week. Uh, and one of the most important ones is Waze is finally going to become part of Android Auto. Now, this is big, Tim. We've had a lot of people say, why isn't that? A navigation option in AA, and finally it will be. Right, Waze is, is, is owned by Google at this point, so everyone basically expected that as soon as Android Auto was announced a couple of years ago, that they would throw in Waze support as well. Uh, but it's actually taken quite a while, and the reasons for that are the way that Android Auto is developed. There are basically templates that every app needs to fit within, and there wasn't really a good template for Waze to fit in. Well, they finally made a custom one for Waze, and so it's going to be coming out sometime later this year, within the next couple of months. Uh, I spoke with Patrick Brady, who's their director of Android engineering about it, and he said there's something that they wanted to do, and they certainly he heard all the feedback and all the requests from people. This means that you'll now have two navigation options within Android Auto, both the basic Google Maps and also the Waze application. They look pretty similar, but of course with Waze you'll be able to get notifications from other drivers, warnings about uh, traffic congestion, debris in the road, and police officers too. Uh, and you can very easily with uh, quick button touches or even by voice you can report your own issues uh, and earn yourself some points for your Waze profile. So it definitely looks like a good update and, uh, and I'm eager to give it a shot. Yeah, for folks who don't use Waze, it is, as Tim mentions, it's the sister to Google Navigation. A lot of folks have asked why, if Google bought Waze, why isn't that and Google Maps turn-by-turn -turn navigation folded into one thing so they each have the goodness of each other. Uh, a lot of it apparently comes down from the fact that when they bought Waze, they got a fair amount of scrutiny from the FTC about anti-competitive uh, con condensation of the market. So I believe that's a, a significant part of why they haven't made it one nav product to because to my mind anyway, it's infuriating that I have two choices from the same house. I tend to use Waze more often, but I know that Android tends to default everything over to Google Maps, and that's annoying. Yeah, it's definitely frustrating to have things split. And of course, Google Google navigation does include some smarts from Waze if there's any traffic congestion or accidents reported in Waze that will show up in Google Maps. But ultimately, it would be nice if they would just kind of come together and have the best features of both. So you don't have to worry about hopping back and forth between the two. But now at least you do have the option of having either one in Android Auto. And a lot of other nice updates coming too from, from Android Auto. You won't have to have a compatible head unit in your car anymore. You can actually have Android Auto just run right on your phone. So if you have a, a dashboard mount for your phone, you can just run Android Auto right on there and get all the power of Android Auto, all the voice recognition, all the messaging, all the compatible apps, useful in a simple non-distracting non way, excuse me. Uh, and having that without having to have a compatible head unit or having to buy a new car is definitely a very nice thing. And they're also, you were writing uh, this week, go down the road away, it's not released yet, moving more toward front and centering Android as... Uh, I mean, it runs a lot of cars already in the, in, in the root sense, but it may show up more and more as a native uh, service or an operating system running in the car to actually run the head unit, even if you're just an iPhone user. I mean, making it an automotive platform as opposed to a, uh, a telegraphed phone platform. Right. As you mentioned, we do see Android running in cars, running kind of behind the scenes. And a lot of cars are running Linux as well, which is kind of the root of Android itself. But what they want to do with Android N is make it a little bit more powerful and a little bit more flexible so that auto manufacturers can have their car running Android N 
in a dedicated way so you can actually install apps right on your car. And to, to do this, they've made a lot of extensions to Android M. For example, there's multiple display support, so the car could be running a display behind the dashboard for all your gauges and all your instrument clusters. Mm -hmm. In addition to other displays that would sit in the center console and even in the rear seats, all powered by Android N with a full Bluetooth stack and everything else. So you have apps running in your car, connected to your phone. And then, as you mentioned, it could even connect to an iPhone and running apps that way. So it could be a powerful thing, but given how long these things take to kind of gestate within the automotive industry, probably looking at a couple of years before we see Android N actually running in any cars. Yeah, folks, we're talking about, you know, this taking over the whole inside displays, uh, first row, second row, IP, center stack, becoming the, the control and the visual presentation engine of all the things that are high touch within a vehicle. And that's a, that's a major shift. That moves Android from being a mobile operating system to being a mobile operating system. So yeah. that would be a really big deal and really put Android front and center in cars when and if that happens. I uh, I find that exciting because I'm still I still bristle at the fact that so many car makers will adopt CarPlay or Android Auto and wedge it in alongside all of their past legacy LCD IPs or head units and I end up with too many, you know, talk about fractured. They say Android's fractured. Cars are fractured with so many competing interface and service units coming together now. Right, and that's one of the things that Android N would offer to auto manufacturers. Right now, if you add Android Auto support in your car, like you mentioned, it kind of sits alongside everything else. It always looks exactly the same, regardless of what car you're in. With Android N, manufacturers could personalize the experience and make it look how they want to, so apps could look in a very distinct way. They could look different on a Mercedes-Benz versus a BMW. And that personalization could drive to a, uh, a an experience that is open and compatible with a lot of apps, but still distinctive enough to look different as you go from one car to the next, which is something that I think everybody wants to see. So that could bring a lot more power to cars and a lot more standardization. And as you mentioned, it could get rid of a lot of this ugly fragmentation that we see. Yeah, so a lot of big things going on around Android and cars and, and having it more centrally in vehicles as well as being the very strong sort of a parallel that it is that is more uh, phone-centric today in the vehicle. Uh, some related news from Hyundai around Android Auto is uh, that they are going to be extending what Android Auto does. I mean, Tim and I have been telling you how very fixed and regular it is, how it's very controlled, only shows certain apps in certain very clean, common templates. But uh, now Hyundai wants to take their automotive sort of telematics functions, you know, trying to get road side assistance, uh, activate a valet geo code so your car doesn't run away when you're at the restaurant, things like that, vehicle health reports, uh, book a service appointment. They're going to have another card, if you will, that's going to be present inside of official Android Auto. When they first showed us Android Auto about a year ago, they, they, they kind of showed where there was a, there was a place for an, another button at the bottom uh, that would take you to this. So they've now announced that that'll be available by in production cars by the end of this year. Uh, we're chasing down an answer from Hyundai on whether and to what degree that will be retrofittable, uh, upgradable to the current uh, maybe 15 or 16 Hyundai that you own right now uh, that has Android Auto in it. So we'll keep an eye on that for you. Uh, now moving on now to, uh, you know, Tesla has had such incredible uptake of pre-orders for the Model 3, and everyone was talking, you know, how far will it go before it peaks, and, and we kind of know what it is. We kind of have a number now. 373,000 firm booked, cleaned orders, pre-orders for Model 3. Tesla announced that they had uh, about 12,000 people that either withdrew or had, there were duplicate orders for some reason. So if you're, if you're following the horse race, Tesla settled in at about 373,000. And Volvo's got, um, Volvo's got, I guess you'd call GLA envy, Tim. I mean, we, I, I see a lot of GLAs here in the Bay Area. They seem to be cropping up like mad. And now Volvo's got a new uh, prototype, a concept of what they call the new 40 series, not the old V40, uh, that has an awful lot of GLA DNA in it. Yeah, that sort of premium small crossover segment is definitely blowing up in a big way right now, and Volvo wants to get on board. They've had such great success with the XC90, which was our car of the year last year. Now they're bringing that into a smaller car with these new 40 series concepts. Um, they look great. They've still got that new front end that we see on the XC90, but a little bit more mm -hmm. daring uh, styling in the rear end, which I think is good because the XC90 is a little bit boring as it goes away from you. Uh, but ultimately, these look pretty great. I think they do look a little bit uh, familiar, perhaps, but uh, these are just concepts at this point. The big news, though, is in the power train. Uh, Volvo is saying there'll be electric versions of these cars available and also the twin engine hybrid versions as well. Uh, so you should be able to get really good gas mileage or go full electric if you want to. But uh, again, these are just concepts at this point. Not looking to see a production version until next year sometime and then probably be another year or so before they actually hit dealerships. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought until I was looking over this story that, yeah, Volvo's kind of absent in that incredibly hot uh, compact premium compact premium car, let alone compact right. premium crossover. And that's kind of where all the heat is right now. That's huge area. 
Yeah, absolutely. And Volvo is definitely shooting up market with the XC90. They're definitely trying to push their brand up higher, which they've had great success with so far. So I think these will be successful cars for them. I think they should be great cars if you know the XC90 and the S90 are any indication. Uh, but again, we're going to have to be a little bit patient until we actually start to see them on the roads. And I also just uh, realized when you described it that, yes, when the XC90 is going away from you, it's kind of like it's just a wall of metal. It is one of the more, yeah. more bland back ends. Yeah, there's not a whole car. lot going on in the back of that car, unfortunately. <laughs> but the front end looks so nice, you know, you kind of... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I guess they, they, they did double the work in the front and half the work in the back. Uh, right. Is that Mercedes-Benz pickup truck ever coming is a question a lot of folks ask. Well, we talked about it here on the show. You've undoubtedly seen some of the, uh, the spy photos of it. And it's a mind-bending idea, a full-size pickup from Mercedes. It's like, is this a great idea? Is it brilliant? Is it peanut butter and chocolate? Or is it the next segue? Uh, the latest we have, uh, reading a story in Automotive News this week that kind of dug into where is this thing is, you know, they first promised a decision on production in 2015. And then by middle of this year, which is kind of here and no decision, then there was word that they would decide next year. Now the latest uh, is they'll decide whenever is, is the quote. Uh, what's happening here is uh, they're getting a lot of pushback from from some of their dealers in the U.S., the most notable of which is their largest, the guy that runs Auto Nation, the largest chain of dealers in the country, Mike Jackson, who has flat out told Mercedes, don't. Don't go there and try and take on F-150, Silverado, uh, and, and Ram 1500. Um, and I, I, have to, I have to agree. I mean, where do you think a Mercedes pickup would find any traction? Who, who wants a full-size luxury pickup? Yeah, it's definitely an odd bird, and it, you know, it seems like a, a car that would really have to have success in the U.S. Because it's hard to imagine it really being any kind of success anywhere else in the world. But yeah. uh, you know, we've seen luxury pickup trucks come in the past from uh, from Lincoln and from Cadillac, and ultimately they've they've never really done that well. Obviously, the market's a little bit different now than it was before. The SUV market's booming right now, so maybe there is an opportunity, but you know, it remains to be seen. The, the new Ridge line is doing well from a marketing standpoint. We'll see if the sales back that up. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's definitely a big question mark. Will people pay extra for, for luxury on the truck rather than just functionality when trucks are such, you know, function over form vehicles? I'm, yeah. I'm a little bit skeptical myself, but ultimately, you know, there are interesting things going on in the market right now with SUV sales, like I mentioned, and luxury SUV sales in particular. So maybe this is just the next extension or evolution of that. Yeah, there's something about a bed that just changes a perception of a car or a vehicle yeah. from uh, from an enclosed vehicle. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, the the Lincoln Blackwood you mentioned, and what did they call that 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 Cadillac pickup? That was was uh, it an Escalade I'm, variant? Yeah, I'm blanking they on the name it, myself. They called the Escalade something, I think. And then there was that uh, the Chevy that had the convertible cab, where you had the kind of openable back doors in the back, and all of these kind of got lost because I think they started with a luxury message first. Uh, whereas if you start with real truck, like an F-150, and then add right. King Ranch to that, you mm -hmm. end up kind of getting to the same place, a luxury truck, but you don't lose your truck identity. You just add luxury to it. Whereas a Blackwood or something, it just blotted out the truckness and came on too strong as a wannabe car. I think that's where the Mercedes issue is. They got to figure that out. Yeah, it was the Escalade EXT, by the way. I just looked that up. But uh, Mercedes d d does have the G Wagon, you know, which is very much a hardcore oh, yeah. old school off roader. So, you know, they've got a little bit of chops in that regard. And whether or not they could make this an actual hardcore truck with some luxury trimmings in the top, you know, it definitely seems like to your point that they'd be coming from the other way. And if it isn't a serious truck to begin with, then, then you know, what's the point? I just want to be able to get to the day where I can go down to the uh, to the rental place down here, rent a pickup for the weekend, and have it be a an all white stripped Mercedes pickup. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you've hit real volume. The white interior, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, right, gray vinyl interior, mm -hmm. <laughs> and a and a rack in the bed. That's Perfect what I want. For going to the work to the work site, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we come back. We're going to talk about uh, some new Uber stuff. One is on the road, and one is in the palm of your hand. And we're also going to run down a very long lightning round of more news about <laughs> scandals and cheats in the car business when AutoComplete continues.
to Autocomplete, Brian Cooley and Tim Stevens. It's our weekly podcast of all the news about cars and tech coming at you from Roadshow at theroadshow.com. Uh, Uber has long had the ability in the app to say, share your ETA. So somebody would know your progress on a time basis uh, toward your destination. But they are now adding a new feature where you can also let people actually track you turn by turn on your ride. And I guess it's largely being driven by, you know, fears of safety. It's like, yes, I'm okay. You can follow me in the ride here and my Uber driver is not going to stab me or kill me. I mean, that's, I think that's where this is kind of coming from. Yeah. And this is basically an extension of having the ability to have a family profile in Uber. So you can basically send, sign your kids up in Uber and have them be able to pick up a ride and, and build that to you directly, which makes sense. And this way you can also track them to see where they're starting from, where they're going, how long it's taking them to get there. So you can know where they are make sure that they're safe. In theory, you can also know that they're going somewhere you want them to go, I hope, uh, and see how much they're, they're billing to your account. So, you know, there are definitely a lot of advantages here, particularly yeah. if you are a parent using, uh, you know, having your kids use your account, but it does sort of tap in into the uh, fear and the notion that Uber is always watching you where you go. But of course, we all knew yeah. they were doing that anyway, didn't we? Yeah, we knew that anyway. Now they're just revealing it. And it's almost kind of uh, comforting in a way. So this, again, will right, be for people that are in your family profiles, not just anyone willy-nilly. So if you've already got someone in your profile there where you could uh, you know, pay for the fare or split the fare with them, this will be a new feature for that list. I don't believe it lets you just send anybody in the world a link. And you do have to have the Uber app on the other end if you want to track someone who's invited you to do so, which is a clever way to get more people to install the Uber app, perhaps who don't already use it or are on your list and not active Uber users. Uh, speaking of Uber, they've got their first autonomous car actually running on the streets of Pittsburgh. For one of our Pittsburgh PA uh, viewers, uh, keep an eye out for this thing. It's a kind of a dark gray Ford Fusion hybrid with all the usual very prominent gear and LiDAR on the roof. Um, you know, this is just one car. I think it's their first car anywhere that is actually on the road. But these guys have big, big designs on making self-driving work. Yeah, it's interesting that they are testing in, in Pittsburgh because right now Pennsylvania doesn't have any autonomous car legislation at all. So it's kind oh, of the wild west out there. You can do anything you you can you know in theory do anything that you want to, or you can maybe not do anything at all. It depends on what the police officer says huh. when he pulls the car over. Yeah, right. uh, but but ultimately, um, Uber's been building their program outside of the Carnegie Mellon. You, university programs of autonomous driving and that sort of thing. So they've really pulled a lot of researchers from Pittsburgh, so that's why they're testing there. But if you see this thing, it looks like it's got the world's greatest sound system on the roof, the way that they've designed all the sensors <laughs> to stick out there. It's got the LiDAR sitting on top, of course, but all these optical sensors that look all the world like woofers and tweeters. But uh, yeah, definitely keep an eye on that out in the road. Um, these are the sorts of things, you know, you have to test in the real world, so there's no point in being super secretive about it. And indeed, yeah. Uber just released pictures uh, today to beat everybody at the punch. And, uh, yeah, interesting. They're testing in an area where, of course, like you say, it's the Wild West. I hadn't thought about that. And, of course, it's got real weather. So let's I think we're seeing right. more and more of these cars being tested in real places where yeah. they can actually see how they deal with conditions. That's okay, definitely encouraging to see rather than just testing in California where it no yes. really does much. Of California, Nevada, where it's one weather all the time. All right, folks, right. Uh, get a cup of coffee, settle down. It's time for the Scandals and Cheats <laughs> Report. <laughs> We've got a lot of them, but we have every week. Uh, so first of all, if you've got one of the large GM crossovers, which just recently had their own MPG scandal, uh, the latest word is that they are working fast to clear this out of the headlines on getting some kind of a compensation plan. It could be a check. It could be a credit for service for free at the dealer or something like that. But this will cover 170,000 Chevy Traverses, GMC Acadias, and Buick Enclaves that had overstated MPG numbers. For example, if it's an all-wheel drive, uh, they were telling you you'd get 1724 on the window sticker, when in fact you get 1522. It was a screw-up in terms of their bookkeeping. This wasn't, by any uh, indication, uh, sort of sleazy stuff like Volkswagen, just a relatively honest mistake. So we'll keep you an eye out for that when you've got some kind of a comp coming. And Tim, looks like Suzuki also now is the latest to admit cheating on MPG testing uh, in the Japanese market. Um, I think with Suzuki, we can now say every single major auto brand in the world has now been found to be cheating on MPG remissions. I don't think there's any yeah. left. And it's interesting to see how they're all cheating. So Suzuki, in this case, they were cheating by doing their MPG testing in a tunnel, which is one way of definitely cutting down on any wind resistance in the car. It wasn't a vacuum by any means, but it definitely did uh, help the cars oh, a little vacuum. bit. Oh, vacuum, that'd be good. No one's, no one's used a vacuum yet. Okay, someone's right. got to try that. <laughs> uh, Hyperloop MBG testing, that's the next generation of, of cheating on emissions. Uh, but Suzuki did interestingly say they don't need to restate any uh, figures on these cars because ultimately the testing was good enough anyway. So despite all the hubbub, yeah. they're saying there's no need to restate anything because they're just fine. 
Yeah, I don't want to be I don't want to be cynical, but shut up. Just don't tell anybody then if the, the results <laughs> are the same. Out loud. <laughs> All right. Nissan's been accused of the South Korean market of it's a small one, but of cheating using a defeat device like Volkswagen on the Qashqai, which they sell there. Uh, that is a um, that's equivalent to one of the crossovers we get here as an infinity. Uh, only 800 vehicles, but uh, here the Koreans say that they had a cheat device on their MPG. Nissan's got 100 days uh, to reply on that. Uh, Mitsubishi Automotive, uh, they've just lost their president of that division because of the scandal as well. And uh, this has been one that's really hurt their finances. It's what triggered Nissan to buy a controlling stake in the company because it was so ailing. And again, this is Nissan. This is Mitsubishi Automotive. It's just a subdivision of Mitsubishi Heavy, but still, it's a big company. And uh, just, to, just when Volkswagen couldn't get any worse headlines, uh, their hybrid technology might also have some be in some hot water. Uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, International Trade Commission is investigating if VW's hybrid tech and corporately around the VWs, Porsches and Audis as well, uh, has ripped off the uh, patents of a company called Pace in Baltimore, which apparently has got patents with Toyota, Hyundai, Kia, licensed out their hybrid tech. Now apparently VW may have taken their hybrid tech from this company called Pace and used it without permission. They just they, they can't not step in it. No, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And, you know, with all this extra light being shined on Volkswagen, it's just hard to imagine that the story is ever going to get better. But certainly I think we are still in, in for a lot more bad news on this front before we finally get to some good news. And GM is going to add recalls to their uh, their ownership app, their telematics app, uh, if you will. It used to be called OnStar Remote Link. Many of you probably have this. They're about to change that. And the new edition that will come out will be called My Whatever Brand Car You Have. So My Buick, My Chevy, My GMC. And when they do make that conversion to this new branding and this new app, they're also going to put in a new tab to check my car for recalls. It's part of how they're kowtowing to the government to say, look, we're doing everything we can to get in front of Keygate and do our part uh, to, not that it's their fault, but do our part to uh, get ahead of Takata Gate. Uh, and so they are going to be putting a more strong up front and center recalls tab. Normally car makers used to bury this kind of stuff. They didn't want you to think about recalls unless they absolutely had to put the word out. Now it's becoming something very different where they realize it's part and parcel of making cars and, uh, and being clear about it. And our last story today is the strangest one we've had all year. Is this, is this, what are they doing at Google, Tim? You've got the best connections there. What do you think that they're thinking with the sticky hood? Well, uh, the, the idea is that if you get hit by a car, of course, that's going to hurt. But not only is it going to hurt <laughs> yeah. getting hit by the car, but it's going to push you forward. And at that point, you're going to fall on the pavement, and that's going to hurt as well. The idea is if you make the car sticky, then uh, the person who gets hit by the car <laughs> sticks to the car, and they don't have to worry about that secondary impact. Uh, the problem is... If you look at the Google car, it doesn't really have a hood, and so there's no real place to make it sticky. The patent application shows a traditional car or a traditional hood, the idea being the passenger would fall over and break some kind of surface on the hood, exposing an adhesive of some sort, mm -hmm. and stick them to it. Um, but if you don't have a hood, I don't see how that's going to work so well. I think it means the adhesive has to be that much more of a fast tack. So I guess so. It's got, it's got, you've got to stick like that. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to yeah. slide down and then get run over a block later by the same car. Yeah. That's no good. It's, it's a crazy concept, but you know, I, I think Google's taking the, the software engineering approach to auto development, which is patent absolutely everything. You know, any yeah. crazy idea that you have, just in case it might be applicable somewhere down the road, put a patent on it. That way you don't have to worry about getting sued by somebody else later. So, uh, you know, I can't imagine we're actually going to see sticky hooded cars, but uh, you never know. Yeah, I mean, oh, how we laugh, but it does point out an important part of getting hit by a car, which is not just that initial impact where your head typically hits that really unforgiving cowl area, but then yeah. that secondary injury where the driver necessarily panic stops saying, oh, what did I just do? And then you get launched a second time into whatever is out in right. front of that car. It could be traffic, could be a hard curb, could be a pole. Uh, it's, it's just nasty. So we, what they're going after here is actually very laudable. It's just a <laughs> hell of a crazy vision yeah, of how indeed. to get there. All right, folks, that's autocomplete for this week. Thank you so much for checking in with us and appreciate you subscribing to the podcast. Tell some friends about us. We try to keep folks on top of what's going on with cars, technology, and engineering in a, a different, fresh point of view. And, of course, stay on top of everything by heading over to theroadshow.com. Make sure you subscribe to our newsletter there when you get there as well. For Tim Stevens, I'm Brian Cooley. We'll see you next week.